Welcome to the programming tutorial for looking at small angle scattering data with Python. I will in short repeat the overview from yesterday. So it's the second part of the three-part session. Yeah. Yesterday we had a look at how to work with Jupyter notebooks in general, a quick introduction to Python with data structures, plotting, functions and file folders. I will show the um, notebook from yesterday um, after this. And today we will look at actual small angle scattering data from a file and loading it and plotting it. I am not sure if we um, have enough time to manage um, building also a small angle scattering model additionally to that, that. but um, yeah, we will start with the first part of loading and plotting some small angle scattering data. That's it for the overview. Let's switch to the notebook from yesterday. That's a notebook we basically created, or I created yesterday. I'm not sure, perhaps um, you followed me along and also yeah, replicated this notebook on your account setup. I hope everyone can find the collab session again. So basically it's um, on collab.research.google.com and if you're logged in, you get immediately this uh, overview of recent files. And yeah, can pick a notebook from yesterday perhaps or create a new one. And that's what we will do then. So by clicking on the name, we can, we can rename this. Let's say it's day two. Um, Python for small English scattering, day two. Yeah, a short recap of what we did yesterday. Let me rename this. So um, we had a look at uh, how to output, uh, how to let Python print some things, output numbers and texts, and um, how the notebooks can be used with um, formatting text and documentation, with showing formulas, LaTeX formulas, and yeah, some basic math, how to get um, yeah, the most important math functions from imported, from imported modules built in in Python, which is a math module, and also from NumPy, an external package, for even more um, math-related functions and modules. And I also gave a quick overview of the basic uh, data structures available in Python, such as lists and arrays. Arrays are typically um, imported from NumPy, the NumPy module, yeah, in Python built-in, there are also dictionaries, which are often used for settings. So you can have named settings, um, named, yeah, such as named values, and dictionary is best um, yeah, thought of as an array with associative names. So associative array, which means there's a description for, uh, it's possible to set a description or any other object as key for a value. It's also called key value pairs. And, and um, yeah, they are in Python ordered, like uh, after the, the alphabet. So typically, the, if you print a dictionary like that, it gets um, yeah sorted by uh, alphabetically. And from that, we also had a look at basic plotting. So yeah, plotted some numbers, um, got a nice uh, plot view, and had a look um, how to generate numbers for plotting, for example, x vectors and y vectors, and yeah, how to format the plot, basic settings, um, colors of, of um, plotting, plot curves and symbols and uh, axis labels, legends and grids and so on. Last thing we um, had a look at yesterday where um, how to yeah, define functions. Yeah, how they can be defined and uh, how they can be used uh, with plotting, for example. Functions are often some kind of shortcut or can be used as shortcut, so you can encapsulate a more complex calculation um, without blowing up a certain other part of code where you just plot something. Then you can yeah, kind of encapsulate the calculation you actually do there, such as shown in this cell where we plot the squared function over some range of uh, x positions we calculated or let Python generate before the cells above. That's it um, basically from yesterday. And today 
we wanted to have a look at files and folders. Uh, let me first add some description of today. Starting with files and folder, folders, I think it's um, worth mentioning that there are two ways of handling files and folders in Python in general. So there's an old module which is called um, os.path. OS is for an operating system. For example, you can import the module like that and there's... Oh, nothing is returned now. But it gets you the, the current part of the notebook we see. So this is on the server side and it uh, represents the path you can see here on the files um, symbol. If you click on it, you get a file browser and um, the path we are in here is the content path on the root of the uh, file system structure. That's basically what it gives us. The next thing would be to show which files exist in this uh, in this folder. I would yeah for this I would call the listdir function, which then returns all files which are in the current directory if I do not provide a directory. So in this case. I could, it's the same as I would pre, um, provide the argument of the count directory. It gives the same, so that's the default name. But yeah, as there's a directory called uh, sample data, I could also add that here and have a look into the sample, de sample data directory and it lists me the names. This is a list returning here. We can see this at the, uh, by the um, rect yeah, square brackets at the beginning and end of this listing and we could pick a certain file here by um, using square, square brackets ourselves. So for example, you know, the second one, which is index one, but this is only a relative name. This is the file name. If um, we want to, we would want to read this, we would have to um, provide it with yeah, the directory it's in. Oh. That's not going to work, and or make it making it absolute. For this, um, there would be a function called join, which basically joins path names in a, a platform independent way. Oh, yeah, which uh, provides me then from the path of the notebook where we are in the path of the file I selected. That's the old style, and now I will continue with a newer module for that. Which is a path object from the pathlib library. And um, to get this, we import it in a different way. So we can say, um, instead of just import the whole module, we can say um, that from the pathlib library we import only the path object. And that's a more object-oriented way. So a path returned is then an object indicated here by the POSIX path name, but it provides some um, convenient member functions. So I could easily say um, it should give me the absolute path Oh, 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 that does not work. From that, it could also give me the parent. It's like going one uh, directory level up. And it provides these um, convenient functions by adding a dot to the object we have at the moment. So for the current directory, I would also, I would create a variable called CWD and append the path here. If you now return it, it returns only a dot. It says it tells me it's a POSIX path uh, object with a dot. So the dot here is um, a placeholder for the common path. This um, kind of uh, default symbol for the current directory for the relative name of the current path on many Unix systems. And that's why we have to add here the absolute to get the absolute system path. So in, on Windows, it would then include the drive letter, for example, on uh, Unix or Linux systems, you get the, um, the, the root file system, the full path from the root. So here it's rather short. We are just in the content directory. 
we can using this object oriented path we can also create a deal listing or get a deal listing in a new cell we can call a function called eta deal but this does not give directly a list but it allows us to which is called to iterate over the list of entries with the so-called for loop we did not have this yeah, I didn't mention that yet. So that's um, also called control structures for program flow. But here I use it as a very short and concise way to go through this list of um, files it provided and return one by one. So that's what it says in the beginning. It says it's, it's ordered to be yeah a bit more uh, readable, so it says give me file name for every file name in um, come working directory it idea like an iterator over the directory. And then it gives me a list which consists of two files. Yeah, for that I could also just uh, let it return the final name of the file name without the path if I want to. So in this example, we um, do not have um, any more files like that uh, for testing or we have in sample data. Ah, that's, that's a good example here. So instead of the current directory, we could also um, use the sample data directory again to get a few more files to play with. Oh, that doesn't like it. Uh, but This uh, path objects are, have some uh, handy shortcuts available, so I could combine it here. So perhaps you have a look at it um, alone in a previous file. So we have the variable for the current directory as shown above, and then I kind of divide the next path name, uh, the next directory name, and it combines it automatically with the um, appropriate uh, separator between names. That's what this, um, that's what the main um, task of this class of this file and path handling object is. So it uh, concatenates those two parts, and I can then tell it to iterate over this uh, concatenation of parts. So that's what it does here now. And then the cool thing about this uh, list comprehension, is it called, indicated here again by the square brackets at the beginning and end, I can um, I can filter, I can use it for filtering the entries. So I can filter over this file name. So it reads again, um, basically for every file name in the current directory of, and combined with sample data, I can yeah, ask if the file name ends with yeah, some extension CSV, for example. It should only return those. Oh, it doesn't work directly with the um, path object, but I have to take the name. So it only takes then the um, yeah, final component of the path for yeah, testing if it ends with CSV. So that's, yeah. Basically, that it uh, consists here of two parts. I can format it a bit more nicely, like that. The first part is that it iterates over the um, file names in the directory, and the second part is that it filters or tests something. That's what I um, showed earlier and yeah, showed yesterday with the strings. That there are um, also functions for string objects. This ends with function is typically for string objects. It's a test and tells me true or false if a thing, so if a text um, variable a string ends with the given um, text I provided it with. And if it's true, it um, yeah includes this element in the list and returns the name of it. If I really remove the name at the beginning, I get the full path. So it's a full absolute path name of the file ending with csv. 
And the result, result could also be stored in a file, uh, in a variable to be used later. Later on, yeah, for some, for automatic or some kind of batch processing, for example. The point with the data I provided. So yesterday I showed a, um, that I had a Git uh, repository where I provided some sample data. Let me show my slides again. So I had this list of uh, documentation and, um, and resources to um, look up. Here, well, here I had an entry for the course material I provided and it leads to GitHub. And there's a data directory with the um, sample data of silver spheres. We can click on it and then we see a list of yeah, the listing what is in the file. It's a basic text file with lots of numbers and on each line there are three numbers separated by so-called white space. I, we don't see here if it's a space, it's probably a tab symbol. Yeah, it's just white space and we want to yeah, first thing we want to get it here in the um, notebook or in this uh, working area. So what we could do is just uploading someone, something. So in my case, it's uh, translated here. I could say upload something and Yeah, just tells me that files will be deleted if my um, yeah, one-time file session ends. And then I just uploaded the file here to work with. But if it's only accessible online, I think it should be possible to upload it um, or let it uh, download. I will test this. So in a Jupyter notebook, it kind of... Let me see if a command can be called. Yeah. This wget command is a typical shell command on Unix Linux systems to um, download something. And in this case, I copied the um, file URL by clicking here on the raw, not clicking, but um, doing right click on the raw button and letting it um, copy the link address of this file. And then it should be able to download this. Let me first delete this for the purpose of testing this. <laughs> and now it downloaded it and should appear again in content. Yeah. I will comment this out. So by um, pre prepending a hash mark uh, in front of a line, this code is not run anymore, so it's not downloaded again and again, and does not complain that it exists already, so I just disabled it while still being able to, yeah, reading it. So now we upload it on the, our data, and you need to get the file name, so one solution would be to just um, type, of, just type the file name here. And yeah, it's always a good idea to test if we um, typed it correctly and if it, this file exists or as expected. So I would create a path object with a file name and then there's a test function called is file, which should return me true or false if the file exists or not. That would be one method. So Another way is um, using this uh, etld uh, example I showed above. So I can copy the whole thing and not using sample data, but only the current working directory and restricting it to dot files. Then it gives me an object with this uh, uploaded data file. I could um, assign this to a variable. So let's call it file name data short. Okay, this doesn't return anything because it's nothing is uh, returned here. Or oh, I did not tell it to return something. 
And here we see that it returns actually a list which is indicated again by the square brackets. And yeah, to work, yeah, to fix this, because we only want the path object directly, I can pick the first entry in this list, which is a zero, and then I get this path object of the file. We have now the file path. The next thing would be to load actually data. For this, I introduce a new module, which is called pandas. Pandas is a very um, extensive package for data analyzers. Perhaps we just Google for it a moment. And for the documentation, looking for pandas doc. And then we get the pandas documentation. Here again, we see that um, yeah, quite a lot of material provided, such as the user, gu user guide. If you yeah, want to step in, they have also even a 10 minutes guide to pandas showing many of the features with examples and yeah, how to use them and so on. And yeah, important sometimes also the um, API reference. So what we will use now here is an object, something like a workhorse of pandas, the data fr frame object. That's the first hit here. And yeah, it shows the data frame object and all the uh, functions and methods it provides, so it can do a lot of stuff. It's basically something like a large table that represents uh, columns of data, which can have indices, which can be sorted somehow and filtered and even plotted, so it also integrates a plotting routine. Um, but what we actually need for reading data in is a routine called readCSV. This is not in a certain object, but it produces a data frame object in this case. So it's also a very, yeah, very versatile function. It looks at first quite overwhelming, but also, yeah, for all the parameters and options that, yeah, it can uh, take and it provides. But, um, often it's important to not, yeah, not, not being afraid of this many options, but uh, looking at them step by step or one by one. So here's a quick overview of all of them as I, uh, as I uh, yeah, described them above. And in the lower part of the documentation is then step yeah, for each setting a description of what it does and what the default settings are typically. And for the most um, use cases, you will not need so many, only yeah, a handful at maximum. So in our case, I will show this, which um, should be valid for many um, ASCII data files. We can provide here directly the file name. And yeah, now I will um, run this cell, and we can see step by step what it does. And yeah, at first we see that it's not uh, the intended result because it contains three columns. But what we can also see here is that it provides a nicely or generates a nicely formatted uh, table view, which is not so uh, not so bad yet. But we see that in the value columns or in the value fields, there are the values concatenated because it thinks that. Yeah, perhaps it's text or something. Between the values, we see that there's a backslash T symbol, which is um, a character of tab space, tabular space. And yeah, we have to tell it that it um, that it has to take every kind of white space as separator. So the sep parameter is yeah, in short for separator, separator between value fields. It, means and here we see that the default is probably a comma because it's CSV like comma separated values but uh, we want it to be a special symbol which is very uh, flexible it's a backslash s and a plus so backslash s represents a character of white space it can be different kinds of white space for example a backslash t or a space or backslash r, I think, but um, here in the documentation we see that this 
this is a set parameter, which is described here, we see that this is also some kind of um, default setting, this backslash s plus t. So if you, you know, don't know, or if I wouldn't know, I would have a look here in the documentation and then it describes it that um, this backslash s plus can be used as some kind of you know, standard um, separator between data files. And when we use this one, we get nicely formatted columns here because it then knew that it should interpret this backslash t also as kind of separator between the data fields. This is provided here as some kind of string um, element, this backslash s plus, but um, in front I wrote an r that is that the Python language should not interpret this uh, string here as something. I think it also works without R, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes there might be problems with um, the code interpreter that it thinks I wrote something in the text which it should interpret and do something for text formatting, for example, but I don't want it to and it should then um, hand further forward this value to another function which will use it and that's what this um, leading R is for, but in this case we can just uh, ignore it, it doesn't change anything here. And here we see that we have three columns, but it takes the first value as um, header names, as column names, and to fix that there's a parameter called names where we can provide the actual names of the columns. So this is some information we have to provide because it's also not included in the file. We can have a look at the file. Here it starts already with the numbers. And yeah, it's a list of names which should be as long as um, as a number of data columns, columns we have in the file. So the first one would be Q for the Q vector. The second column would be I for intensity. And the last one I would call here UI, like an uncertainty of intensity, or error is also a valid option, or whatever you like it to go on. And when we run this cell, it now uses the provided names for the column names here at the top. And also the number of rows is now the correct number. This thing it returns here is a data frame. We can call it like that to remember us what it is. And we would have to give it back here to see this, still being able to see this table. And the data frame, yeah, as shown before, provides many functions. Also, um, a very convenient way to accessing the data here is that you can directly access the columns by typing dot q, for example, then you get only the q values. At the end, it often always tells you the kind of the, um, of the series, as it's called, because it has some index values at the front and then the data values. And it tells you that it's of data type float 64. That's a very good or very high precision value and has 535 entries. The same can be done for i and so on. Sometimes, yeah, you want to access only the q vector or the i vector, especially when plotting something. But for plotting, um, we could do it like um, we did yesterday, for example. Like right, when I go back to the previous slide, if I imported this, I will copy and paste this and modify. So we imported matplotlib, the pyplot um, submodule as PLT and provided some values to the PLT. And instead of those values we provided there, we can directly put in there the um, data frame columns Q and data frame column I. to get the plot. So this is now linearly plotted and we see that yeah, in linear space it uh, drops rapidly to zero and then you don't see anything <laughs> for a long time. Um, here I would remove the marker because it um, kind of makes it very full, the plot. 
or very thick and yeah to being able to have a better better look at it a better view we could um, set it to uh, lock oh no I missed the argument Yeah, so lock, lock scaling on the x-axis and also lock scaling on the y-axis and then we get the um, plot of you know, small angle scattering data we are familiar with and that's one way to plot the data in the same way as uh, plotting um, yesterday with uh, simple data or generated data but uh, what I wanted to show is also that is um, that the data frame itself provides a, plot, a very convenient plot functionality. I could call this plot function directly at, on the data frame object and select the columns in the arguments and then it would plot me the same thing but shorter with less code and I can always recommend to use as little code as possible. So here I can also provide the error bar, really simple. Um, we would need to tell it that it should <coughs> enable log plotting and perhaps color the um, I hope I remember this correctly. Color the error bars in a different way so that it does not uh, overlap the data and kind of confuses or makes the plot uh, broader, broader than it actually is. Yeah, here you could see that we can also set and configure nearly everything, but as it's here, here it's provided as arguments to this plot function of the data frame object. Also, the grid is just an argument to the to this plot function, and within parentheses we can easily make a break in a line so that it doesn't get so long and uh, difficult to read. We can just continue on the second line and um, provide a label with it. The label could I would like to use here the data file name we um, loaded. If I just provide the variable, we have to make sure that it actually contains the text. And I scroll up. Oh, it contains the um, POSIX path. So in this case, it uh, directly appended here the POSIX path, but I could also just um, use the name, the last part of it, would give me then the um, file name only in the plot. Yeah, that's basically plotting the data I loaded from file. Next thing to look at would be generating a synthetic model. So for, for fitting a model to small angle scattering data, what I would need is here first the data curve from file, what was measured, that's that we did here. And the second part would be um, a calculated model. We would to um, overlay it to the measured curve and adjust the parameters so that it fits to this uh, measured curve. That's it basically. Thank you very much for your attention.